to our second panel of the 2015 Justice Summit. Once again, my name is uh, Jeff Adachi with the Public Defender's Office, and uh, this uh, panel uh, will focus on solutions. Uh, you, we heard earlier uh, about some of the problems. Now we want to look to the law enforcement officials uh, in the city uh, as to how we can address these problems, not only individual cases and the comp some of the complaints that we heard about earlier today, but how do we address institutional racism? How do we address uh, the systematic uh, use of excessive force, the judgments that are made every day, uh, and how do we bring accountability uh, to the system and to the individual cases? Uh, in San Francisco, we've had a series of scandals involving law enforcement, and it's, it's forced us to seek solutions. This panel will address that through our criminal justice leaders, uh, but first, uh, a short video uh, that will cover uh, some of the difficult issues that have been raised. It's supposed to be funny not to be broadcast on the news. It's the same old negative stuff that I heard in Mississippi where I was born. Our membership is appalled with these texting incidents. The San Francisco police chief wants eight of his officers fired in the wake of a scandal involving racist and homophobic text messages. KPX 5's Maria Medina on how the police chief is doing damage control, trying to restore public trust. And the police chief held a news conference today for about an hour. He announced in light of the texting scandal, he'll be randomly selecting police officers to check to see if they miss any red flags in their background checks. It, it just makes me sick to even talk about it. San Francisco Police Chief Greg Sir says the eight officers, including a captain, caught exchanging racist and homophobic texts do not belong in his department. I have suspended them, and they have been referred to the police commission with a recommendation uh, uh, of only termination. But his afternoon announcement was just one of several scandals he addressed, including the investigation into a crime lab analyst and supervisor accused of failing to tell investigators if suspects' DNA matched criminal profiles in a federal database. Is that there could well be suspects that we, w that we should have gotten identified, that we should be conducting investigations on? I find it repulsive. Uh, in my entire 30 year plus career in law enforcement, this is some of the worst allegations that I have seen. The district attorney created a task force to look into all these allegations as public defender Jeff Adachi threatens to bring back at least a thousand cases in the last 10 years back to court. Because the evidence of these racist texts uh, affect the credibility of the officers, any case where a question was raised as to whether the officer was telling the truth has to be looked at again. The chief says he's well aware of how his department appears to the public right now, but insists his mission is to repair its image. The trust in our police department's not lost on me, that it's taken a major hit, and we will do everything we can to rebuild that trust. Sheriff Ross Mercurimi announced that the FBI has agreed to his request to investigate allegations by two inmates in the county jail accusing deputies of forcing them to fight like gladiators. There is no potential conflict of interest by an outside agency coming in. I mean, quite frankly, they're the gold standard. The four deputies named by inmate Ricardo Garcia have been placed on administrative leave pending outcome of an internal investigation by the sheriff. Mercurimi wants to see if other deputies were involved or witnessed the fights and whether they bet on them. Now introduce uh, our panel, uh, but before I do that, I, I wanted to acknowledge uh, that the uh, director of the Office of Citizens Complaints, Joyce Hicks, is here. Uh, we would have invited her on the panel, but her agency is charged with investigating uh, some of the cases and complaints that uh, you heard about uh, earlier today. Um, but her agency is in charge of uh, responding uh, to complaints uh, by the citizens, and uh, there is a whole process that they go through in investigating uh, these complaints. And so uh, please visit their website to learn more about uh, the, the work that they do, the important work that they do. Um, but uh, it's my great honor to welcome uh, San Francisco District Attorney uh, George Gascon. 
uh, San Francisco Sheriff Ross Mercurimi, San Francisco F uh, Police Department Sergeant Yolanda Williams, who is the president of Officers uh, for Justice, Assistant Federal Public Defender Galia Phillips, and SFPD Commander Tony Chaplin. So welcome and uh, thank you for, for serving uh, on this panel on accountability and change. We're really gonna focus on solutions. How do we address these issues? How do we fix these issues? Now, I'll start uh, with you, District Attorney um, Gosco. You recently announced, uh, as we saw in the video, uh, the formation of a task force to investigate the police officers' racist Texas. We also had uh, issues relating to mishandling of DNA evidence and forced fights arranged by sheriff's deputies. And let me ask you this first question. You have to rely on police officers in court. Doesn't that compromise objectivity if your agency is investigating the very officers that often testify uh, in criminal cases? No, yeah, that's a really good question. And you know, the, uh, the way that our criminal justice system works is that prosecutors at the federal and state level, and by the way, DAs are state prosecutors. We are constitutional officers. Uh, we are the chief law enforcement uh, person in each county. Uh, and constitutionally, one of our charges is to investigate public corruption, which may include police misconduct. Much like the federal side, where you may have a U.S. attorney <coughs> investigating police misconduct either by a federal agency or a local agency, uh, at the same time that they may also be working with those agencies in prosecuting other cases. So it's not uncommon uh, for prosecutors from one side of the prosecuting house to be working with law enforcement in their day-to-day -day operations, but on the other hand, have a public corruption unit, which we do in San Francisco, and, and we take that work very, very seriously. <coughs> Frankly, it would be no different than the FAA. You know, most people know that the, the Federal Aviation Administration investigates airlines, but they also work with airlines on a regular basis in order to further the work of the industry. I think there is a bigger question here, and the question that I see, and one that I heard an earlier speaker on the prior panel talk about, is the issue of transparency. And there is no question that the credibility of the system is being put into question. And it is for that reason that we're taking several steps in my office. First of all, the, the, the creation of the task force was really the product of the overwhelming level of work that came our way. Uh, when the, the text messages were made known to us through the Chronicle, um, we immediately had our public corruption unit, which handles uh, investigations of police officer misconduct, begin that process. And one of the things that I did is I said, we need to look 10 years back at every report that involved these officers, and more importantly, we want to see also who they work with, who they were supervised with, and begin to try to understand whether racial or homophobic bias play a role in any of this activity. Shortly after the first announcement by the Chronicle, we see a second article, this time by another Chronicle reporter, that there were not only four officers, but that now there were possibly 10 other officers. So again, we find out through the media uh, that this problem is occurring. About a week later, we also find out through the media that we have a problem with a DNA lab. And we find out through the media, courtesy of a public defender, um, that uh, we had this gladiator fights within the jail. That created a workload issue for us that we could no longer investigate these cases under our normal structure with, by the way, our public integrity unit is separated, not only physically, they're in a different building, but they are prosecutors that are not involved in the day-to-day -day prosecutions, and that is done for a purpose, much like you will see the civil rights section of the U.S. Attorney's Office being separated from the regular prosecuting functions. And there is a good reason for that. We do want to create a wall between the two. But the immensity of the workload uh, that we face, it required that we restructure the way we did business. And that is when I announced that we would put this task force together and we divided the workload and basically created three teams. One team 
to investigate the text messages, and they were already in the progress of doing so. One team to investigate the problems with the DNA lab, and another team to investigate the sheriff department. And the team with the sheriff department, we are the lead investigating office with the assistance of the FBI on conducting an investigation of the fights. And on the jail scape, we are embedded with the FBI and the U.S. Attorney's Office is taking the lead. So there are two investigations with the Sheriff Department. We're leading one, the fights, with the assistance of the FBI, and we're supporting the other. And the reason why we're doing that, by the way, it goes back to the charge of the county district attorney. We are the ones responsible to make sure that law, law enforcement works within the parameters of the law in the county, and we're doing so. And the federal agencies recognize that we have that primary charge, and that's why we're working together. In the part of the DNA, DNA is a scientific process. And the reality is that prosecutors are lawyers. Some of them may develop expertise around science, but they are not scientists. And I recognize that we really need to have scientists and we need to have best practices around this because frankly, when I was a chief of police, we had another problem with the lab. And at that time, the problem had to do with our drug lab but even in that process, there was some indicia that there may be some problems with the DNA lab. And at that point, I call upon the Attorney General to come in and take a look at our work, and they did, and they gave us a passing grade on everything except the drug lab, which we knew obviously wasn't working since we had an analyst that was stealing drugs for her personal use. And I shut down that portion of it, I had a press conference, and we made it public. Moving forward to what we are today, I think that more than an issue of who conducts the investigation, because clearly that responsibility falls in the lap of a district attorney in any county, I think there is a question of transparency. And there is a question of faith in the system. And faith in the system has been shaken by many of the incidents that we're seeing around the nation, whether it's Staten Island, whether it's Ferguson, whether it's Baltimore today. And I believe that some of the things that we need to do in order to bring back faith to the system is that we need to have transparency. And technology today allows us to do things that we could not have done even 10 years ago. And that is to be able to collect large databases of video and be able to store them in a way that we could not even have 10 years ago because while cameras for police departments have been around for nearly 20 years, the reality is storage was a major problem, but that problem is no longer the case today. Cameras are getting smaller, and the ability to store large numbers of information are today what they weren't a few years ago. So one of the things that we have done, and this morning I sent a letter to the mayor, to the chief of police, and to every member of the board of supervisors requesting two things. Number one, the governor, I'm sorry, the president's task force on policing in the 21st century made a recommendation which I agree with, is that is that we should have video for all police encounters with the public, and we support that, and I'm asking the mayor to fund, no later than January 1 of 2016, body cameras for every San Francisco police officer and to ensure that every transaction with, public, with the public are recorded. I believe that the majority of... <laughs> I believe that the majority of police officers are honest, hardworking men and women and this is something that they would welcome because it protects them as well as it protects the public. Transparency, when we do things in the open, everyone is protected, the community is protected, our police officers are protected. So I am hoping that the mayor and the board will take this to heart 
and that we stop playing games because we have now been talking about cameras for the San Francisco Police Department for over a year, and yet we still don't have them. And there's no question of technology or protocols anymore. There are so many departments, even Oakland, right next to our door, has been using cameras, and they have a good protocol for how to handle that information. So that is not new. The second part of my request, which is new, and it's not being done anywhere on a regular basis, is that effective July 1 of 2016, I want every arrest conducted by a San Francisco police officer to be accompanied with video from that arrest. I believe that that would, thank you. I believe that that would facilitate not only the work of the public defender and the prosecutors in court, but I think it would further enhance transparency. And again, the technology to do that work exists today. It didn't just a few years ago. And in that request, I'm also requesting that both the public defender's office and my office be funded to make sure that we have the technical support to handle that information when it comes to us. So we will be seeking to have an arrest report with whatever information that arrest report comes traditionally, but in addition to that, to have <coughs> a video of that transaction. And if for any reason video is not available, then we want a supervisory explanation as to why not. I recognize that sometimes equipment may malfunction, but that should happen very rarely. And we want to make sure that we are serious about the importance of having this information. Finally, in that request, we're asking that data sharing within the system be more readily available. We have problems today. We can't even tell you how many Hispanics are being arrested in this county with any degree of certainty because currently most of our police information is recorded either with black, white, or others. And I don't know about you, but I don't like to think of myself as an other because I am not an other. I have an identity that is much more than just simply being called an other. And we have a very diverse community with large segments of the population that are neither black nor white. And we cannot accurately assess the impact of the entire system in our entire community unless we have good data. And that data needs to be there and there are no longer excuses for us not to have that data. So in closing into this question, I think that is paramount for all of us, by the way, because this is not just the district attorney, it's not just the police or the public defender. This is a community issue. We need to come together and demand that our system become a more transparent system, demand that that information be readily available to anyone that wants to see it, and demand that we support our police officers when they're doing good work, that, but we hold them accountable when they're not, or prosecutors or anybody else in the system. So that is the response that I have for that first question. And frankly, I'm looking forward for the responses from our borough supervisors, our mayor, and our chief of police on this issue. Okay, thank you. <laughs> you heard it first here. <laughs> Sheriff, uh, Mayor Creamy, many of the deputies and officers that were named in the re recent scandals uh, had previous disciplinary issues, and one had even been sued for uh, sexual assault. The city had essentially admitted liability and settled the, the lawsuit. How do we prevent uh, problem uh, law enforcement officers from slipping through the cracks and going unnoticed? And what's the system in place to, to vet employees for uh, racial bias? Uh, it's good to be here uh, back again at uh, your summit, and I'm honored to be here with um, this very important panel with all of you. I'm going to integrate your question, my answer to your question, with a couple things that DA Gascon just mentioned. Um, you may have seen just recently, um, I announced that we are the first county jail system that will be bringing in body cameras uh, in the state of California. And why that's news is that while um, there is applause for the notion of greater transparency for law enforcement on the street uh, to be equipped with body cameras in response to Ferguson and Staten Island and all the other upticks uh, that were riveted by and 
with problems occurring in California, even here in San Francisco. When I was back in DC meeting with President Obama's point person on community-oriented policing, they weren't talking about the prisons and jails. There was literally nothing in their menu for community policing uh, that extends to prisons and jails, which to me is like flying a one-wing aircraft. It doesn't fly. Uh, it's myopic. When you consider the amount of contact that law enforcement uh, that law enforcement has with people who have been previously uh, implicated in the criminal justice system, those uh, experiences and exchanges do become, at many times, flashpoints themselves. In my opinion, what makes this conversation much more complete and full is that there should be a national, state, and local requirement that those who work in prisons and those who work in jails also be equipped with body cameras. If we want full transparency, if we want, um, I think, what is better informed training and then greater accountability, which gets to part of the, your question, then it needs to also extend to prisons and jails. When I was a member of the Board of Supervisors, I pushed hard for greater transparency and making sure we never have another drug lab scandal again. And since it was mentioned, I think it's important to remind this uh, panel and this audience that we push to have that drug lab and future DNA lab not be under the auspices of the SPD, SF Police Department. And why? is because the National Academy of Sciences had issued a report back in 2010 that said drug labs and crime labs should not be in part of a partisan jurisdiction under law enforcement. We legislated that it be under the separation in anticipation of a $75 million bond towards the rebuilding of the lab itself. Public Defender Adachi came to testify for that, but there were others who opposed it, and we the bill got killed at the Board of Supervisors. I think that, though, was very unfortunate. And that extends now into five years later, where are we? Well, the point is, is that if we really want to be, I think, uh, upstanding, uh, and pursue every variable possible in greater transparency that's both on the outside and it's also on the inside. Starting when we hire people. I pulled out exactly what our hiring process is, everything from a background investigation to a psychological evaluation to all the vetting, and it's a rigorous vetting, that the uh, employment team, recruitment team, people who vet over the hundreds and hundreds of applicants we get of people who aspire to be deputy sheriffs. And the questions are very poignant. I was concerned when we're hearing more and more about the, uh, the bias, the overt bias, and how that translates, I think, to the misdeeds and misconduct of peace officers on the street, and how that also might be a miss inside our county jail system. But the catch is there and so is the flag. My worry is that what happens when you have a careerist inside where there isn't the flagging of somebody along the course of their five or 10 or 15 or 20 year career until that there is a problem and a system that should react to it to snuff it out. There needs to better, be a better reflex by law enforcement. And frankly, I think that there needs to be, uh, and in the sheriff's department, a better reflex in holding supervisors accountable, not just a grievance or complaint system that when something happens to an inmate or somebody that is encountered by one of our deputies, uh, and that that complaint is processed, that we're looking just at the complainant themselves and not how they may have been enabled by the chain of command that maybe turned their back. We've heard of the thin blue line on the outside on the streets. Don't think that doesn't exist on the inside in prisons and jails. This is exactly the whole point that as shocked, astonished as I was heard when public defender Adachi told me the day where he had his press conference uh, that I uh, participated in about these staged fights, that the gravity of it, it's not that I don't trust the DA to not do a proper job, it's just that I believe in San Francisco that needs to make sure that the integrity of investigation needs to be completely uninterrupted and unfettered from any kind of incestuous politics or any kind of missteps that may have occurred in the past, especially as I've seen with what's occurred with the SFPD. So I said, and I followed through, that I would reach out to the feds, and I was glad that they granted my request. This has not happened in modern history in San Francisco, where unless it's been court imposed, federally imposed, where the feds come in, where that that has occurred. 
And so an investigation is underway. Press is here. In fact, there will be a press conference tomorrow on another installment uh, in terms of the outcomes of our uh, investigation. And we'll continue to keep the public informed as to the um, progress that we're making in holding these deputies accountable. The severity of our response, I think, sends a proper message. Is it a preemptive to anybody who may be thinking about misstepping again? I hope so. I also like to think of it as the glass half full, that it's better preventative medicine in setting a new tone in making sure that uh, we're serious about uh, any kind of abuse uh, exceeding one's jurisdiction or authority, unbecoming of the color of being a peace officer, that under our administration or anybody, that we will not settle for this whatsoever. And in any case where there has been a clog or bottleneck of complaints or grievances by an inmate or somebody who's been encountered, uh, by our deputies, this is why I asked to meet with people, as I heard of a previous panel, where somebody had that kind of encounter and concerned about that particular uh, exchange, where I asked them to come and talk to me personally. That's why uh, being hands-on is important, of sending the kind of message that we're going to reform our system, which we're underway, frankly, we've been trying to do right now, an early warning system that based on complaints and grievances, it could be minor, it may not be minor, of a deputy who's abusing an inmate, disrespect, whatever the level of severity may be, that we want to flag it and that so that it becomes a telltale that explains to us what we might be able to do to prevent that from ever escalating again. Does that need to be reconciled with the Peace Officer Bill of Rights Union? You bet you. Does it have to be reconciled with the Department of Human Resources to make sure that it comports with those tight parameters in respecting our employees and, as peace officers, their rights? Yes, we have to. But I'm uh, completely focused on making sure that these reforms go through. I don't think it's just about body cameras, by the way. I don't think it's just about pronouncements by electeds or by department heads. I believe it's about political will. I'm a little, um, frankly, a little peeved that when I'm hearing about a letter being sent to the mayor and the board of supervisors for requests on certain accruements that I believe are not luxuries but staples, I send this letter to the mayor and ask the mayor over two years ago. When I came into this office, I came in as an independent reformer suggesting that, hey, I get it, it's not very popular with my staff, but I'm gonna hold those folks uh, completely accountable, but I'm gonna need the tools to make it happen. So in order to make that happen, this is the upgrade that I'm asking for. The same kind of training that the police on the streets have been asking for and the funding that they're getting it, like crisis intervention training, when they deal with somebody who's unstable, who uh, is exhibiting the kind of mental illness or psychological concerns so that they can de-escalate uh, what otherwise we've seen uh, to be a tragic outcome, don't think that doesn't happen inside the jail system. Now that we've become the largest provider of mental health beds in the city, you can understand just the friction that's percolating every time. So when I ask the mayor and the board of supervisors to consider the same level of upgrades that they're doing for the SFPD, that should be mirrored by our expectations of the sheriff's department. Then what we're doing is a more fluid reform system and quit treating like these are enhancements, San Francisco doesn't need it, we're liberal, we're progressive, it happens everywhere else. I don't buy it. I don't think our city's immune to any of the problems or flashpoints we're seeing around the country. I just think that we're good-hearted enough and smart enough that we can try to nip it in the bud from it getting any worse, which is why I'm really glad that we're all congregated here today. And if anybody wants to see the letters that we've been sending or the communications to the mayor or the board of supervisors about any of these enhancements so that we can then literally lateral up with the police department to make sure that we are the finest agencies in this country that shows what what it means to uphold the law in the way that you would expect us and be the public servants that one would uh, certainly uh, ex expect us to aspire to, that's exactly what we've been trying to do. So outing this discussion, I think, is so very important. 
This is why in 1999, I was part of the same group that co-wrote the Sunshine Laws that gave birth to the Sunshine Laws known as Prop G, and in 2003, our ability to bifurcate the police commission from not just mayoral appointments, to then to also Board of Soups appointments. Independence, transparency, and accountability is vital, and that's how we get to some of these answers. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> Sergeant Williams, you were personally targeted in the in the racist Texas that were, that were um, talked about earlier, and, and that um, Michael referenced uh, in, in in his remarks. Um, this has been portrayed as just an isolated group of officers who are engaged in this. Based on your experience as a sergeant in in the police department, how deep does this go, racism uh, amongst police officers? And what ideas do you have as a president of Officers for Justice to address it? Thank you. First of all, I want to make it very clear that speaking for myself and the Officers for Justice, we know that this is not an isolated incident. This problem is systemic within the San Francisco Police Department. And unfortunately, there have been some who have chosen to turn a blind eye. We have members of the Officers for Justice that have served in the San Francisco Police Department for 30 some years, and they inherently remember incidents similar to this and some even far more egregious than this that have happened to minority officers. So I want to first make that very clear. The next thing I want to bring to your attention is that we have consistently had a problem with the dis disciplinary process within the San Francisco Police Department. As a minority officer, I can personally tell you and attest to the fact that when a minority officer stands before the members of the command staff or the commission, unfortunately, when their cases are heard, minority issues are dealt with a little bit more severe. The discipline is more severe. I have a member that was involved in something that you probably recall a couple of years ago called Videogate. He was suspended for 365 days, and now today, I stand before you as a woman that was called, and I'm just going to tell you what I was called, a nigger bitch. I'm going to tell you something. First of all, it's offensive to any female that has risked their lives on a daily basis for the citizens of this city. We entered into this position considering it a noble one, and that is why we gave our lives and we committed ourselves to serve and protect the citizens of San Francisco. These rogue cops have been disrespectful. They are, have brought discredit to our uniform. It is outright bigotry and hatredness. And as a victim of this, the thing that hurts me the most is the outright betrayal of this department. As a victim of this crime, and I call it a crime, the act that they did. I have not, I have not been interviewed by the Internal Affairs Department. They have not asked me, how do I feel? They have not asked me, do you feel comfortable? They have not asked me, do you feel safe in your work environment? I also hold the mayor of this fine city accountable I have asked him repeatedly for, for a meeting, and he has failed to respond to our request for a meeting. I also hold my chief accountable because he had the ultimate opportunity to step ahead of this. However, he chose to do what was politically, I guess, correct. And in his political correctness, he has yet to address the rank and file members of this police department. I don't care that it was only a handful. I don't care that it was less than 1%. It still reeks of corruption because 
Where there's that 1%, there still could be more. It's viral. And the thing is, is that we have members within this police department that are not guilty of it. By far and large, this, the members of the San Francisco Police Department are fine members, and they try to serve you in their best. However, I joined what I thought was San Francisco's finest, and now it doesn't feel like that today. It doesn't feel like that for many of the minority officers. And it wasn't just offensive to African American officers. It was offensive to women. It was offensive to LGBT. It was offensive to Asian Americans. It was offensive to the Latino officers. It was offensive to American Indians. You dare to even go to the American Indian officers, really? I mean, come on. When do we hold people accountable? We have asked for transparency. I was advised, and I'm going to make this known now, that the Officers for Justice had heard rumors that this had occurred. And that was the Thursday before the story broke on Saturday. And what I did was, doing the right thing for my members, I called the chief and asked him if there was any legitimacy to these rumors, because I don't like to work on rumors. I was assured that my members had nothing to worry about and that I had nothing to worry about. <coughs> Needless to say, when on Saturday the story broke, and I find that not only are several of my members named specifically, but then there are text messages in there to do harm to children of half-breed half -breed children, and then I'm informed that my name is even mentioned in there and that my chief didn't at least tell me, you know, there is something going on and I just want to let you know it's, it's a continuing case and your name has come up in it. At least give me the decency and the respect to tell me that there's something that I should be concerned about. To me, that almost feels like betrayal, because you don't do that to your family. You don't do that to people you love. And the thing is, as I say as a black officer here today, because I'm black, I can never be blue enough for you? Shame on you. Shame on all of you. Because I commit my life as every other officer each day to this city. I respect and love every person, despite what of our differences may be. And the one thing that I constantly say and urge is that this department has a responsibility to treat every citizen, even those who we just choose not to like, just treat them with dignity and respect. And what do we have as a solution? Our solution, there are several. Right now I'm going to tell you about two, and then towards the end I'll show you something about the big one that's going to involve the community. But first and foremost, we need to develop a think tank task force. And the think tank task force includes the NAACP, LGBT, OFJ, all of the other police employee groups. It also involves some representatives from the police department. We want to have one of our board of supervisors on there, mental health professionals. We want to involve community activists. What is the think tank for? We need to do a survey, a climate survey, on every officer in the city and county of San Francisco. We need to find out what's pressing on their hearts. We need to find out if they are suffering from post-traumatic stress. I know at this point, I kind of feel like I'm kind of tired. And if I'm feeling tired, I know that there are other of my brothers and sisters who wear the blue uniform that are also feeling tired. But this climate survey will help us determine how deep-rooted this racism really is. I know it's a taboo subject, and we don't want to discuss it. But guess what, folks? It's time to. And the time is ripe now. because. If you don't discuss it now, we may wind up looking at our city and thinking, 
Wow, this feels like Ferguson. Wow, this feels like Baltimore. Oh my God, are we back in Watts? The clock is ticking. It's time for us to take swift action. We need an inoculation. This is a cancer. This is a critical incident. You don't have time to sit there and say, oh, well, let's give it a few more weeks. And you know what? Shame on you if you knew about this two years ago and you let that clock tick so that these other officers can't be disciplined. <clears throat> and if you did that, I say the citizens of this fine city and county need to say start from the top and let's start rooting it out. I'm sorry, folks. That's the bottom line. Thank you. Uh, Assistant Federal Deputy Public Defender Phillips, um, you have led a challenge of legal cases uh, involving Operation Safe Schools. Operation Safe Schools uh, was a, a federal uh, investigation uh, involving both SFPD uh, and the uh, federal uh, law enforcement. And there were a number of arrests that were made uh, in drug cases. And you filed a motion saying that uh, the investigation uh, shows selective enforcement. Can you talk about the case? I know it's a pending case, um, but more importantly, uh, what you believe is happening in terms of race bias in both uh, enforcement and charging. Sure, so Operation Safe Schools uh, was a joint task force between the DEA, um, the Federal Drug Enforcement Agency, and the San Francisco Police Department. And it basically involved two sweeps of the Tenderloin neighborhood, uh, one in 2013 and one in 2014, that resulted in the arrests and of 37 people who were all charged in federal court with selling drugs within a thousand feet of a school. And they all face a uh, mandatory minimum prison sentence of one year. And when the recent sweep started hap happen, we began to notice that every single person who came into federal court was black. And this was disturbing. We walk through the Tenderloin every day. We know that there are people of other races who sell drugs in the Tenderloin. And so we decided to look into this. Um, and what we found when we looked into it was first of all that every one of the 37 people that were charged was black. We then talked to um, an expert, a sociologist, um, to confirm what we already know from walking around every day, which is that, yes, other people, people of other races do sell drugs in the Tenderloin. We then um, looked to see what was happening with the amounts of drugs that were sold, because um, even though the feds can charge anybody who sells drugs in federal court, they almost never charge people with low-level drug sales, because federal penalties are harsh. Um, and so it's typically reserved for people who are moving a lot of drugs, selling pounds, selling kilos. And we found that in the five years before Operation Safe Schools, only two people in five years were charged with selling less than 1.4 grams of crack, about one rock of crack. With Operation Safe Schools, every defendant that we have been able to determine the amount that they were charged with was charged with selling about one rock of crack. So that looks to be about 37 people. We then uh, went through and, and looked at what the purpose of this was, because the stated purpose from law enforcement was to protect kids who were going to school. And we looked at where the high incident drug arrest areas were in the city of San Francisco, as well as where the public schools were. And we focused on public schools just because we didn't have the data for all the private schools um, yet. And we found that there are a number of private schools in the city of San Francisco who are within 1,000 feet of high incident drug areas. None of them are in the Tenderloin. We then went through every video um, that we had access to for Operation Safe Schools to figure out um, what we were able to, what, we, what, what was actually going on. And we found some really disturbing things. Um, in one video, uh, the officers are training a video camera on two black men and two black women who are kind of talking and hanging out on a corner. And you hear an officer say, fucking BMs, referring to black, ma black males, and another officer say, shh, hey, we're rolling. In another video, um, 
in an undercover informant walks up to the uh, person that they've targeted, who's a black woman, but she's on the phone, and she won't sell drugs to him. She's on the phone. She's busy. She ignores him. And an Asian woman walks up and offers to sell him drugs. And he refuses to buy from the Asian woman, waits for the black woman to get off the phone, and then purchases drugs from her. Later, he is recorded in the police van talking to the officers who were basically handling him, and he reports that he was able to avoid the Asian chick by saying he needed the good stuff. So we looked at all of these facts, and we were concerned, and we were worried, and we were disturbed, and we filed this motion. And it's pending. Um, we still have a lot of work to do on it. Um, but there's enough that's here that we really believe it has merit and we need, think it needs to be investigated. Uh, some people have responded, uh, why does it matter if only African Americans were arrested if they were, in fact, selling drugs? And it is true that our challenge is not focused on whether or not any particular defendant was innocent or guilty. Our challenge is about whether or not the operation was fair. And that matters. Fairness matters. Everyone deserves to be treated fairly under the law. And this is particularly true in federal court where people face these mandatory minimum sentences. And because we know that for many years they, the law enforcement did not think it was appropriate to bring people into federal court for low-level drug sales, in fact, two districts in D.C. and L.A. have publicly stated they will not bring people into federal court for less than 50 grams of crack. And again, we're talking here about 1.4 grams. Um, so if it's not fair for a low-level Asian seller or a low-level Latino seller or a low-level white seller to be brought into federal court, then it is certainly not fair for a low-level black seller to be brought in. And that is what our challenge is about. It's about whether or not it is fundamentally fair. Thank you. We did ask uh, Greg Surter, uh, Chief Greg Surter, to participate, and he has come to summits in the past. This year, uh, he had a, a conflict that he just could not get out of. Uh, but he did uh, send uh, Commander uh, Chaplin uh, in his stead, and we thank you for being here. Um, first, I, I want to ask you about the uh, body cameras. Um, District Attorney Goscon uh, has uh, stated his support, as has, has uh, Sheriff uh, Mir Karimi. What is the status of body cameras in San Francisco? And do you think that body cameras will help address the issue of uh, racial bias? And if not, what other steps uh, do you feel uh, are necessary? There's been talk of training on unconscious bias. The Attorney General has uh, uh, recently said that uh, she uh, is going to uh, begin implementing a program. Um, your thoughts? First of all, body cameras are coming to San Francisco, period. Let me start off with that. We're getting them. Uh, a draft policy is making its way through review right now as we speak. We will be getting them. Um, personally, uh, I believe nationwide, every law enforcement agency is going to be deploying body cameras. Every cop will be wearing them. Uh, I'm definitely in favor of them. Um, let me start off by saying this. I'm in the unenviable position of being African-American and being a cop. And this is a tough time for most of the members of the San Francisco Police Department because people they call friend, they're seeing things on the news just like was talked by the, spoken to about the, uh, by the other panelists. They found out the same way by watching the news and hearing these, uh, these disparaging remarks. Yolanda Williams is uh, my classmate. And she's always had this fire in her uh, for the entire 25 years. I've known her, and it's never died down, and that's a good thing. Um, <laughs> you know, as we used to say, she likes to keep it real, as Michael did earlier. And uh, that's what this is all about. That's what this summit is about, is keeping it real. Uh, for so many years, people described uh, bad treatment by police, and uh, nobody did anything because there was no proof to back it up. I think body cameras will give us that evidence and proof to either clear the officer or to allow us to move against the officer for something egregious he's done. So I, I'm, a, I'm a big proponent of the cameras, um, and why not? We use them for every other crime. We use, the, uh, we use cameras for people's homes. We use the crime cameras all over the city, muni cameras. Why not with your, uh, with your public officers? Put cameras on them. I agree with the policy 100%. 
uh, I think it's long overdue personally, and I can't wait to get them and deploy them because, like I said, I think it makes our job a lot easier, not harder. So uh, I'm, I'm a big proponent of the cameras, and I can't wait till we get them. Um, that being said, we are, uh, we are at issue sometimes with the rights of the officers when we try to discipline them once we do get evidence to say that they did do wrongdoing. And all of these things now are being looked at again. And uh, I think it was Michael that said earlier about all the mirrors. And right now, there's a lot of, uh, of self-reflecting going on in every police department, not just in the United States, but in the world. Everyone's looking at themselves now, and they should be. They should be. And I believe that these summits should have been happening regularly and more frequently before now. Uh, I, I'm saddened that the events that recently happened nationwide have drawn us all here, but I think this is an important and good first step in bringing us all out there. Um, I think cynicism and, and bias are probably the, uh, the biggest corruption issues facing law enforcement uh, in the history of law enforcement. And you know, I've got a lot of notes here about things I've researched and I'll refer to them as the panel moves forward. But I will tell you this, I got promoted to commander uh, just this past weekend on Saturday. Um, <laughs> thank you, thank you. And I, I look out and I see a lot of public defenders that over the years, uh, they'll tell you one of the things I've always approached this job with is integrity. And some of us has lost our way. And I'm gonna steal something from the Omega Boys Club with how I think we should address it. Some people get it right away, not a problem. Some people get it sooner or later. We need to train them. Michael, where you at? <laughs> and some people never get it. They need to be fired and sent packing. And that's, and that's, and, and that's why, uh, love them or hate them, that's why the chief made that recommendation. There's just some folks that you can't, there's, there's some things that you cannot redeem. And some of those cases, there, there, you, there's nothing you can do with them. Um, as the panelists were speaking, I got here early today, and I was sitting in the back with a, a friend of mine. I won't out her. She's with the sheriff's department, and we were just talking about how many years ago this stuff happened to us. I uh, had a real bad incident prior to coming to the police department, and it was down in the South Bay. I was in the Army, and uh, we went clubbing in San Jose. And uh, I won't go into details about it. I know we were asked to keep it uh, as short as possible with each question so we could get everything through. But it almost stopped me from being here sitting in front of you. I was born in Muskogee, Oklahoma. So when this stuff comes out, thank you, One Oklahoma House. <laughs> but uh, when this stuff came out, uh, I apologize if I offend anybody, but I wasn't shocked by any of it. Because, you know, most of us African Americans have experienced it throughout the years, and it's old hat for us. So if you're trying to scare me and go boo, it didn't work because we've seen it before. And one of the things I've always done, again, referring to the public defender's office, is uh, I've always been fair and honest with everything I've done. And as a commander, that's what I'm going to demand. When I was the station uh, um, platoon commander at Northern Station, I started my lineups by saying, if you're doing something wrong, do not do it with me present because I will out you, you will answer for it. And I had a great relationship. When I left, they threw me a party, um, begged me to stay, and I told them I couldn't, I was going to homicide. But I will tell you this, uh, if you're honest with people and you set that bar where it should be set, they will perform. And that's what these cameras will do. We'll be setting that bar a little bit higher. Are they the answer for everything? Absolutely not, as you heard earlier from the uh, federal public defender. Sometimes you'll catch some things, you're like, okay, it's still happening. but it will give us a basis to start. And that's what we're asking for. It's one more tool that we can use to, to ferret this stuff out. Because I'm telling you right now, um, a lot of people say it's a bad time to be in law enforcement. <clears throat> Not for me. I got promoted on Saturday. And I'm rising up through the ranks. And, uh, <laughs> and I will tell you this. And I will tell you this. I'm looking back at everybody because I've worked for and with some of those folks that came out in this scandal. And I am appalled. And I will tell you this. There's a lot of African-American officers that are kind of doing a little self-reflecting about people they call friend. And I'm telling you right now, it's, it's, uh, it's a great time to be in this country because things that have been talked about and whispered about for years are now at the forefront of conversations. It's being talked about in Starbucks. Not because somebody made the employees talk about it, but because people are talking about it. This is important. This needs to keep happening. The only way we fix this is by putting it out front. And, uh, you know, again, 
people have different of opinions about the DA, about the sheriff, about the chief and everything, but ultimately, you gotta air it all out. Rip that Band-Aid off and yell ouch once. It beats the hell out of ripping it over and over again and yelling ouch over and over again. <laughs> and that's what these body cameras, and that's what I like, I think a lot of the reforms that are discussed, that are, are, are working their way through the system will do for us. Thank you. I'm going to go straight to some audience questions. We have some really, really good questions here. The first one is for uh, District Attorney uh, Gascon. It says African Americans make up 6% of the population in San Francisco, but nearly 50% of arrests and 56% uh, of those in uh, county jail. Um, why do you think this is so? And are the conviction rates among African Americans 50% uh, or higher? You know, that's a, that's a really good question because it's one that we, are, we have been wrestling with my office since I became the district attorney and we continue to do so. And I think it's important to recognize that as a society, uh, we're still living the history of slavery in this country. And anybody that tells you otherwise is probably not African American. The reality is that both explicit and implicit bias impact every part of our society and the justice system is not any different. We in our office are constantly trying to evaluate what can we do differently in order to assess whether we're doing the work in a way that is conscious of the fact that some of the work that may be coming across our desk may have been influenced by biases. And I have to agree with Tony, and, and Tony, by the way, is very humble. He is actually one of the rock stars of the police department and, and just precisely the kind of leaders that we need in our law enforcement because there are a lot of good men and women in that police department. Um, but one of the things that we're trying to do uh, as a result of the opportunities that are coming together today that were not available even months ago because these conversations have been had, and I, I agree with the sheriff in part that a lot of these conversations about how do we reform the system are not new, but that we're not getting any traction, right? Even as recently as a few weeks ago, when I talked about the fact that we were gonna look at arrest reports and other reports 10 years back for those officers that were involved in this particular incident, I was accused of doing this for, for political reasons, which I find incredibly, incredibly interesting given that I don't think there are too many DAs that during the re-election year would pick a fight with a police department or a police union. Uh, that's just not the way business is done, right? But I'm doing it because I believe it's the right thing to do, but there's also the right time. And I think that we will come out of this in a much better way. So there are several things that we're doing in my office in order to not only fix the problems that may have been brought about by the scandal, but more importantly, as we move forward, what can we do proactively so that hopefully a year, two years, three years down the line, we're not having this conversation. We may be having another conversation about improving the system, but not this conversation. So first of all, I mentioned earlier that we started this task force. We're looking at these reports. And one of the things that we're doing is we have, with the assistance of others, and more of this will become public in a week from now because I, you know, we're still working on other parties, but we're looking at civil rights leaders and other leaders in the judicial uh, community to help us create some grids, and we're working also with uh, others in academia to be able to start distilling from the information that we're getting from those reports patterns that may assist us in understanding whether racial or homophobic bias play a role in police activity. And again, I want to bring you back to what I said earlier about explicit and implied biases in our system. It is rare that you're going to see explicit bias on a written police report in today's day and age. Those are rare. You know, most police reports, for those that have been in the system, understand they're, they're sort of cookie cutter. The, the language is pretty similar one from the other. 
And frankly, for prosecutors that are terribly overworked, especially in this county, where they have roughly about 20 minutes to make a decision as to whether to file the case or not in the morning, and they have a stack of reports, and you're looking at one report at a time, it's very difficult to see whether there was bias engaged in that particular incident. But when you start getting out of the bottom of the forest and you start climbing up to the top of the forest, you start seeing the trees. And when you have the view from the top, then there are other windows and other doors that start to open and inform our decision. And so part of what we're trying to do, uh, which to my knowledge, and we checked around by the way, because I do believe in copying if somebody else has a better uh, idea. You know, in school we cannot plagiarize, but in the work that we do, we certainly can. But I haven't found anywhere around the country that has created templates for prosecutors to be able to look at the work coming through and, and in a short amount of time see whether there are any flags that should then be taken to a second level of review to assess whether biases may have impacted a particular case. So that is one of the things that we're doing. The other thing that we're doing is that we are addressing and providing and we're going to be looking at training for our personnel so that they start recognizing perhaps the impact of implied biases in their, or in their own work every day. As human beings, we all have biases. The question is not whether you have them. The question is, do you understand that you have them? And if you do, are you creating enough safeguards so that those biases do not influence your work, especially when you do what we do, which is taking people's freedom away from them? We're not selling ice cream. We're not creating ops for computers. We often send people to jail or prison for long periods of time, and that process must be completely free of biases. Yeah, and I think we should. So as we're looking forward, and there is no question that there are tremendous amount of disparity in the way that African Americans primarily, but probably Hispanics as well, except in this county, as I stated earlier, they're part of the other, right? So when we look at stats of, for instance, how many arrests were made or how many prosecutions were made, I can tell you with a high level of certainty how many African Americans were impacted. But the other group is a big group, and I don't know what that means. And we have to get to the bottom of that. So what we're going to be doing is, first of all, as we say, we're doing the look back. But more importantly, we're doing the look forward. And I think that uh, assuming that, that we get all the things in place that I believe we will by next week, uh, you're going to see another layer of review on this process that started, by the way, in March, um, that you will see uh, that we're really in earnest about how do we fix the system, just like we're doing with DNA, uh, where we have asked the Quattro Center, Quattron Center out of Penn State to come in and take the lead in reviewing our DNA work and educating us to what, are, what is the best practices around DNA, because by the way, problems with crime labs around the country have been around now for several years, and it, quite frankly, it doesn't matter whether they're run by the police department by the district attorney's office, independently or private, because we have seen them all, and we have seen tremendous problems with crime labs. The most recent scandal, actually, with the FBI, which should be the standard of labs in the country, and yet they have found that possibly thousands of cases may have been compromised by testimony provided by crime analysts in the FBI lab, which has repercussions across the nation. So the question as to who runs the lab, while it's, an, it's one that should be addressed, and I don't necessarily disagree that maybe it should be an independent body, I can tell you that the application of the science and the impact that it has in the criminal justice system has been faulty regardless of who runs the system. And what we're seeking is we're seeking now to have scientists take a lead role in this area and educate us. First it was to the look back, because we don't know how many cases have been impacted in San Francisco, um, including cases and protocols that in 2010 we were told by the California Justice Department that we were okay, and by ASCLA, which is the accrediting <coughs> body for the entire country. 
But more importantly, what do we do moving forward so that, again, we don't continue to repeat history? So that is the work that we're embarking, and we will get to it. We're going to complete it. I am 100% committed to ensuring, as Tony indicated earlier, that these are actually times of opportunity, and we should grab that opportunity, and we should make a difference. You know, the definition of insanity is doing the same thing over and over again and expecting a different result. In the criminal justice system, we have been doing that for too many years. We have talked about the problems. We have all known that the problems are there, but we haven't addressed them often because it hasn't been the political will. I think we're in a different era today. We have the President of the United States talking about the need to reform policing and the criminal justice system. We have Hillary Clinton, a candidate from the Democratic Party this morning, talking about the need to reform the system. We have a new attorney general that comes in with a tremendous amount of commitment to reform. I think that we are at a good place in this nation to start moving away from the historical issues that have kept the system to where it is today, where a small segment of the population represents the highest number of people incarcerated, not only in San Francisco, but in California and the entire nation. And I have to tell you one other thing, because you know, often we bring reform and people very quickly forget. We in California and San Francisco led the way with Prop 47. And our people that are trying to make sure that Prop 47 fails. For those of you that do not remember what Prop 47 was, it was the reform, our drug policy in the state that is already having a national impact. And if you talk about wholesale reform, drug and drug policies in this country have been the primary leader in the incarceration of men of color and some women of color in this country for the last three decades. And for the first time in California, we have come together and we have said, we've had enough of that. This doesn't work well, and other states are looking around. Now, I can tell you there are people that are trying to see that experiment fail. There are people that want to go back to what we were doing before, which in the federal system, unfortunately, still can have tremendous consequences, no longer at the state system. So we need not only to move forward with what we're doing, but we cannot forget the gains that we have achieved very, very recently and make sure that we all are moving forward because Prop 47 was wholesale reform of the primary driver for incarceration in this country for the last three decades in minority communities. Thank you. <laughs> Next, uh, I, I have a question for uh, Sergeant Yolanda Williams. Um, there's an idea that you've been talking about uh, called Not On My Watch. What, what is that? Oh, I'm glad you asked. Um, I have the graphic <laughs> artist here, and I think there is an overhead projection of it. <coughs> Gary, can you come up here? <laughs> okay, and I don't know if this is going to stand oh. up here properly. <laughs> okay. All right. Uh, Harry, you want to come up here too? Okay, Not On My Watch is a campaign public service announcement that we're going to be proposing to every law enforcement agency and also to the city and county of San Francisco. Harry, would you like to uh, explain to them what it is real quick? <laughs> Hi, everyone. Okay, uh, I'm Harry Soulet. I retired from the police department to two and a half years ago, a member of the OFJ. And uh, when all this stuff came to light, it really had a big impact. Because <laughs> for 31 years that I served, I served with honor and respect for my community. And to hear that there were officers doing these things and then trying to kiss it off as banter, locker room banter, I couldn't believe it because in 31 years I never heard anything like that. So when Yolanda approached me and she asked me, I put this design together. And not on my watch is a term that's used when we want something taken care of on any particular watch. When we go out in the street, we tell each other, this is not gonna happen on my watch. 
whether it be car break-ins, whether it be domestic violences, whatever the case may be. We want to make sure that during our watch, this is, does not happen. So I thought, I don't want any more of this disgrace happening on my watch. And hopefully we'll be able to impart that with all the other officers within the police department and maybe across the nation. We cannot allow this to happen. So if you look, you'll see the eye, and the eye is the vigilant eye that's going to be watching over what is going on. We have to report what is not correct, whether it be from a suspect, whether that suspect be in blue or in whatever kind of dress. The thin blue line that runs across the center of the eye across the United States, there was a reference earlier today that was made about the thin blue line. I've written out so that you can see on the bottom there, it's a symbol used by law enforcement. It was originated in the United Kingdom. But it stands for the connection between the community and law enforcement. We are supposed to protect and serve the community. That's what we want to do. We have to sometimes protect the community from ourselves. And we want to make it clear that that's not going to happen on my watch. Uh, Self-explanatory, I'm, I'm very inspired about this because I think that it's time that all departments across the United States take a stance and let's put an end to this. Let's have all the officers throughout the United States, starting here in San Francisco, say, not on my watch. Okay, so with that, you, you know what we're talking about, and I'm hoping that I can get a commitment from, of course, I've already gotten it from Jeff Adachi, but from Diego Scone, also Ross Marcarimi, and every other city agency that's representing uh, law enforcement and the criminal justice system, and of course, all of the citizens. And we want to do a public service announcement where each of you would have an opportunity to say what you're not going to allow to have on your watch. And you know what? I'm probably going to have to be looking for a new job because I've probably really done it in this time. And so if I'm looking for a new job, hopefully Sheriff Rick Mercurimi probably. is going to hire me to do something, even if it's sweeping the floors. <laughs> okay, we're about out of time. I just have uh, one uh, additional uh, question uh, for Commander uh, Tony. If the body cameras uh, are implemented, will film footage be available to members of the public press uh, and not just uh, the arrested party? And you know, without full access uh, to footage, accountability will be a false promise. That's what's being discussed right now through the vetting process of the uh, for the body cameras, because uh, we're calling other departments and finding out what the best practices uh, are with those departments, what's worked, what's not worked. Um, somebody mentioned Oakland's having a successful uh, uh, camera pro project over there. They are, but they aren't. The data capacity and data storage is killing them. It's crippling. And so uh, they're trying to get through uh, dealing with those issues. And so we're, we're looking at other departments to find out what worked because, uh, quite frankly, what, uh, what uh, the DA said, George Gascon, is absolutely right. Can't have glitches. You can't have things fading in and out because then we're back to square one and people are asking, so wait a minute, the camera went out right as they grabbed the guy? Well, what happened? You know, and we don't want any of that. We want uh, a, a seamless uh, integration of these cameras and we want to be able to have them rolling and we want the entire incident captured. Uh, obviously, there may be an issue here and there, but if there's an issue with data capacity, all the cameras will go out. You see it with the radios in Oakland. You see it with the uh, computers in their cars in San Jose. As we move into the 21st century, and I hate saying this, but uh, most police departments are still in the 18th and 19th century. As we move into the 21st century, we're going to have to make sure that we're ready for that leap. And we're already there now, and we're playing a game of catch-up, quite frankly. And uh, the, the policy is definitely being pushed through the system, and they will, they will be implemented. It's just a matter of getting it done and getting the policy done so that we can protect people's privacy, because there are issues with juveniles. There's issues with uh, rape victims, domestic violence victims. And all that stuff has to be uh, taken care of and vetted out because we cannot release that, that, that footage and then have it make its way out some way because then we're responsible as the gatekeepers of that information. 
In closing, I'd like to thank uh, our uh, panelists uh, for their insight and vision. I thank all of you for attending. I, I want to point out that we do have a 10-point uh, racial justice uh, plan uh, that the Racial Justice Committee at the Public Defender's Office has put forth. You can go to our website at sfpublicdefender.org uh, to see that. Included in the plan is uh, an ordinance that would uh, require the police department to begin collecting, analyzing traffic detention, arrest statistics, and tracking for racial disparities, uh, discipline for officers who exhibit racial bias on the job, requiring officers who witness racial bias to report it, and I think this campaign will go a long way, uh, uh, not on my watch to see that happen, vetting law enforcement officers for racial bias and training on implicit or unconscious bias, uh, collecting and analyzing charging, bail, sentencing, jury composition, and tracking for racial bias. I know that bail reform is something that's supported both by Sheriff Merrick Remy as well as uh, District Attorney uh, Gascon. And the bail reform uh, would, instead of relying on a money system, instead look at public safety risk in determining whether a person should be released. Uh, also, the vetting and training of judges, prosecutors, and defense attorneys for racial bias and training on implicit or unconscious bias. Again, you can find more at our website at sfpublicdefender.org. Uh, in closing, again, I'd like to thank all of you for attending. Uh, I'd also like to thank all of the folks that made it happen. Uh, Tamara uh, Apperton, who did an incredible job of pulling this together. Um, Chief Attorney uh, Matt Gonzalez. Uh, Larry Roberts, uh, who did all of the uh, <coughs> graphics uh, for the event. Thank you, Larry. Uh, Susan Gray, who was the stage manager and organized the logistics. Uh, Angela Aoyong, Kathy Asada, Kathy Bull, uh, Kara Chin, and all the volunteers that made it happen. Also like to thank the staff of SFGov TV, who's uh, putting this uh, on uh, public television and on streaming video and Luis Herrera and his staff uh, here at the public library. Also Armando Armando Miranda and Austin Burke, uh, who helped uh, with the video slide uh, presentations. Uh, thank you very much, and we look forward to working uh, on improving the criminal and juvenile justice system uh, into the future. And of course, that's going to take uh, all of your help and support. Thank you.